say uh, we're going to start at 7.15. My name is Brian Pugh, and I'm the Secretary for the Brooklyn Democratic Committee, and I'll be uh, moderating this event. Um, format is going to be relatively loose. Uh, I'm going to try to give the maximum amount of space uh, to our representatives of the respective campaigns uh, to express themselves. Um, so, broadly speaking, the, the, the uh, who's doing this? Sorry, guys. <laughs> oh, please uh, silence your cell phones. Um, so, um, broad, so uh, broadly speaking, uh, the uh, event will be segmented uh, in the following way. First, we'll be opening statements from each representative, uh, the Sanders campaign on the right, Clinton campaign on the left, uh, one for each representative followed by a discussion of the uh, experience and record of their respective candidates and uh, how they feel that that, that qualifies them or uh, for office will make them you know, a good candidate. Uh, from there, we'll discuss uh, domestic policy, uh, foreign policy, and then, um, depending on time available, uh, 20 to 30 minutes of audience questions uh, submitted in writing over there uh, with hopefully short answers to those and uh, closing statements, which may or may not get cut off uh, by the delivery's trying to get this out of that time, because they have a hard close at 9 p.m. All right. Um, all right, so now it is 7.15. Uh, would the Sanders folks like to begin with their opening statements? So, oh, hey, please introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Catherine. <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank uh, Brian Pugh and the Crumb Dems for hosting us in this forum. I think it's going to be an excellent opportunity for us to talk about some of the issues that affect us right here in our home. Uh, some of the information that's out here is uh, about People for Bernie, which uh, I started. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about my history, about how I came to be here. I'm not Bernie Sanders. I'm also <laughs> not a Billy here. Um, I am a kindergarten teacher in the Bronx, and I have a long history of activism, which started in the anti-war movement while I was in undergrad, which is largely how I became aware of the senator and uh, his long talks on C-SPAN uh, to often an empty hall. Uh, and I became very involved in the anti-war movement and uh, learned a lot about Halbert and KBR and how that affected our road to uh, a war that was largely uh, a mistake and uh, has affected many of us here at home uh, in ways that we are still dealing with. Uh, a huge debt veterans that aren't taken care of. I furthered my movement activity uh, with Occupy Wall Street, where I met uh, several of the people that we would one day uh, come together and work on people for Bernie. During Occupy, I had student debt that uh, I couldn't pay, and I wound up defaulting on my student loans. It was an unfortunate situation, but uh, a very serious one that most people my age <laughs> are often forced to deal with. Um, another reason why I am keen on Bernie Sanders. The idea of tuition-free college is very special to me. I teach in the Bronx. I want to walk into my classroom next year and tell each and every one of my kindergartners, no matter what, they're going to college regardless of their economic situation. I also would like to see my cohort not so burdened with debt and able to start families, buy homes, and give back into our community. Uh, that leads us to People for Bernie. We started an organization which was an online platform to help people organize digitally uh, with constituency groups and by region before the senator announced because we knew the senator was going to announce. What we did was we helped people organize in their communities and what we've seen is massive 
and you all see some of those things on a daily basis come to fruition. Uh, over a year ago, it was me and four people in Washington Square Park. It's a little bit bigger now. It's kind of nice to see. Um, I am drawn to this work, not only by what Bernie Sanders does, but by the people that show up for this movement and how much they give of themselves. It's amazing, the dedication. I see many friends in here who have done some of this work with me lately. They've made the calls. They've done the work. It's amazing. They want to change. And they believe that Bernie Sanders is going to help us find a better future. So do I. Some of the most vulnerable 
uh, people in our county. And I am, first would like to say that I'm, uh, I've been a lifelong Democrat, came from a family where my grandparents were Democrats, very proud ones, parents, very proud Democrats. I'm a very proud Democrat tonight because the level of the debate among our Democratic candidates is something that I think everyone in this room and everybody in our country should be rightly proud of. And I don't mean just by comparison to what the other people are doing and saying, I mean in and of itself, and I just wanted to get that out there. Um, but I'm a Bernie Sanders supporter because I believe that Bernie has the leadership that we need to tell people that each and every one of us is valuable enough important enough to stand up and have their voices be heard. For very long, we have been silenced. We have been told, either by happenstance or by design, by the powerful, that what we say is irrelevant. And we have been forced to work so much harder for so much less that we don't have time anymore <coughs> to take stock of what is being done to our country in the name of the Almighty God. <coughs> And Bernie Sanders is a person who has the courage of his convictions. As Kat pointed out, he has many times stood alone in a room and preached a message that suddenly millions of people, not only in this country but around the world, are hearing. It's an important message. It's a message about revitalizing the American democracy. If we don't do it now, it may be too late. There is far too much at stake here because Time is ticking fast. I also want to tell you that I grew up in Canada. And in Canada, we have single-payer health insurance. It, it was there when I arrived. It's still there. People in Canada have phenomenal access to health insurance, to health care, rather, at very affordable costs. And Bernie Sanders' plan for single-payer health insurance, I know that, and I, and I do have to say that, Many years ago when Hillary proposed it, I was so proud of her because this is long overdue in our country. Now, I work, I have private health insurance. I work with clients who have no health insurance or who have minimal health insurance. And I can tell you that life is sweeter, life is better when the government is willing to invest in its people and say that there is a fundamental right that each of us has and it is to quality, affordable health care. When you have it, you don't have to worry all the time about what if. It's bad, enough, it's bad enough to worry, what if I get sick? What will that do to my family? But it's unconscionable in a country as wealthy and as powerful as ours that every one of us has to worry, what if I get sick? How will I pay to get well? And God help me, what if I die? Which, which one of my relatives is going to be left with an insurmountable debt as a result? Now, it's a big, bold idea, single-payer health insurance. It's not going to happen overnight. The core of Bernie's message, and I'm going to speak a little bit about this later, is people power. Everything is possible <coughs> if people rise up and say, we're not going to take this anymore. And when people come together, as he says, there is nothing that we can't accomplish. So is it going to be easy? No, because the insurance industry has such a stranglehold on everything in this country, from the top to the bottom. Is it possible? Absolutely. And the only way it's possible is if we all join together and make it happen. is a very exciting race for Democrats. I agree that this is a marketplace of ideas. It's something that we have um, a lot of enthusiasm over this election. It's wonderful to be a New York resident and know that our primary vote is actually something that's actually going to be relevant to the choosing of our nominee. And I admire both candidates who are this far along in the race. I actually admire Governor O'Malley too when he was in, was, when he was in the race for a short while. But um, I do feel that Hillary is the most qualified candidate, not only in this primary, but frankly in my lifetime, candidates that I've seen run for president. She is someone who has fought for her ideals from her days 
in college from her work in the private sector, in the public sector, as a volunteer, as the First Lady of Arkansas, with the Children's Defense Fund, as the First Lady where she fought hard for rights of ordinary Americans and really took a beating for it. There's no one in our public um, sphere who has been more scrutinized, more criticized, more beaten down than Hillary Clinton, and yet, she keeps coming back, she keeps fighting, she never gives up. Um, Assemblywoman Sandy Galef and I had the good fortune to hear her speak to the Briarcliff Rotary a few years ago when she was our very, very, very able senator. And she told us so many funny stories about how uh, after becoming a junior senator, she'd be pouring coffee for senators who had called her, you know, an evil harridan, a witch, said she'd murdered her best friend, all these things. But she knew how to work with them when, the, when there was goals that she could advance. She did not succeed in, in obtaining single-payer health care for us, and we all were behind her on that notion. However, when she got to the Senate, she made incremental changes. When she could not achieve single-payer health care, she got the Children's Health Plus insurance through, which covers 18 million children in America who would not have coverage otherwise. She is a fighter. She keeps fighting. She is uh, one of the most admired women in the whole world from her tireless work as Secretary of State. She was our senator. She's our neighbor. We know her personally. We know when we call her office for help with a constituent issue from our neighbor here in Croton or in Chippewa or in Yorktown, that her office was there to help people. So she is a person of big ideas, of tireless effort, but she's someone who also really gets the job done. And that's what we need right now. I am delighted that um, Sanders is in this race because I think it's great to have these big ideas talked about, discussed about, how people really feel like these things are possible. But I also know, having been in the political arena for about 15 years, what it actually takes to get things done. And unfortunately, big talk is not sufficient. It's very important. It's very important to rally people, to make people believe in the future. It's very important to have big ideas, but it's also very important to know how to get things done by working with people that you, don't, you might not agree with for the greater good, so that we have the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And that's why I support Secretary Clinton. discussions of the candidates uh, experience and record in office and uh, how that would make them a good nominee and a good president um, and again to all, to all the representatives uh, the time limit never was very good about observing it is four minutes and if you don't feel that you're under any obligation to use your maximum amount of time in fact who knows you might get points for real life is this a judge debate? <laughs> <not yet. laughs> Judge next Tuesday, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Um, so, starting back with Kat, I guess. So, for me, again, um, <coughs> I'd like to echo again the experience I found with uh, Senator Bernie Sanders in his vote on the Iraq War was very special to me and compelling. But I think some of the experience that's also very compelling in this race is his good judgment when it comes to the Keystone XL pipe, his good judgment when it comes to NAFTA. Uh, also, when we're talking about uh, bipartisan leadership, uh, amidst reports of unacceptable wait times for many in the VA, he was able to pass a bipartisan legislation for uh, veterans and the bill, which was co-sponsored by John McCain, um, authorizes 27 new medical facilities and provides $5 billion to hire <coughs> more doctors and nurses to care for the surging number of veterans who need it. My mother works at the VA, and I can tell you this is needed. She works in the VA in the Bronx, and she worked at the VA uh, in the city. And what we're seeing is obviously an increased number of PTSD and uh, traumatic brain injuries. These things are severe issues and 
nobody should be sent to war and not be taken care of when they come home. And I think that is one of the most important and compelling issues about the senator, is his commitment to keeping us out of bad trade deals, out of war. This is some of the most important things you can ask for from a leader, is by setting a, a standard for human rights, for uh, benefits, for the people that work to build this country and protect it. And I think that's good for me. I think I think I'll call my round. As tough as they talk, they are not as tested. 
Hillary is a unifier, and she has a record of working across the aisle to get the job done, and that's what she's going to do for New York. And that's why I feel that Hillary is the most qualified person to be our president. Well, um, I, I would like to focus on three things about Bernie Sanders. They're all, I think, inextricably interwoven. And when taken together, they are what makes this man an extraordinary leader and the person to lead our country um, in the coming years. First, it's his worldview, which um, was informed by his early childhood. I'm sure we've all heard him speak about the impact on his, um, on his worldview when he learned about the Holocaust and how, um, how a government can take hold of its people, deprive them of a voice, of a voice and then atrocities follow. Um, and, and I think he's spoken very eloquently about how that taught him more powerfully than anything else about the importance of, of people's involvement in the political process. Um, and then, of course, he has a life of social and community activism that started from the time he was a very young man. Um, it was not, he didn't do it in the limelight. He did it on the tough streets of Chicago when he was in college, trying to desegregate housing. And we all know that Chicago is a pretty tough town. He's led a fight to end racial discrimination everywhere. He has fought for workers' rights. He's a real family's value, family values candidate, in my view, because he fights for the little guy in every conceivable way. Um, he has stood up for the shrinking middle class, of which I am a member. And he has spoken out about the horrifying gap, an increasing gap between rich and poor. Um, he's an optimistic man. And he is idealistic, but he's certainly realistic. <coughs> and um, he, of course, has earned himself a solid reputation. He's an honorable and trustworthy man. And that's in large part due to the fact that he has been calling these things out. He has been standing up for these things for his entire adulthood. Um, and so people in Congress say that they can always trust Bernie, because Bernie is a man of his word. He has the courage of his convictions. He's not afraid to be unpopular, and he's not afraid to tell us the tough things. He also has uh, sound judgment, and that has been evidenced by, as Kat mentioned, um, his opposition to the Iraq war. It has, as when it was happening, he forecast that it would be a quagmire, um, that it would destabilize a region, and in fact, he was right on both counts. Um, he forecast the economic crash of 2008, years before any of the rest of us realized it was coming. And in, you can check this out on YouTube, in a really wonderful moment, um, Bernie Sanders called out the then exalted Alan Greenspan. Um, on his naivete, um, on his attitude, his pro-business attitude, and, and on the collision course that he was directing on behalf of business in the United States. Um, and then I want to talk to you about his political savvy, because that is not something that really we speak about very much when we're thinking about Bernie Sanders. But in fact, he's a quite, quite a savvy politician. And I don't mean to say that in a negative way, but he knows how to get things done. Now, in a fractured Congress like we have in our country, unfortunately, he's known as the Amendment King. He knows how to get important measures passed, even if you can't get it through Congress on a bill uh, on its own. He works across the aisle. He has been a vocal spokesperson, as Kat said, for veterans' rights. Um, and as I said before, he is trusted. He was uh, the ranking member on the Budget Committee. Um, and as I said before, he has the courage to awaken, as a leader, he has the courage to say to all of us, speak out, be heard. That's what the democracy is all about. Um, and, and for me, the fact that we have a person who is telling people, calling people, to rise up, shows that he is a man of incredible courage. And for me, that is an extremely important asset for a person who wants to be the president of the United States. First of all, let me say that being called a 
savvy politician is in no way an insult. <laughs> I think many of us will agree. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, as I said before, I really believe that um, Hillary Clinton is the most qualified presidential candidate that I have seen on either side of the aisle uh, in, the, in the time that I have been alive and aware of politics, which was very, very early on. Uh, because my family was a political family, and uh, we discussed things like how you actually get things done, how you actually affect change in the country. My parents are both from Brooklyn, like Bernie. So um, I think that um, one of the things that uh, has impressed me about um, Mrs. Clinton is that she is someone who, throughout her, and any situation that she's been in, she has done things to advance the causes that she believes in. She has done that facing a tremendous amount of criticism, facing resistance, facing intransigence from opponents, and yet she has always managed to move things forward. Um, I think she is, uh, if you look around the world, as Lisa mentioned, Lisa gave such a good, um, exhaustive list of, of um, the Secretary Clinton's accomplishments, but it's really just the tip of the iceberg because she's done so many things both as a volunteer in the private sector, at, in, in all of her roles, um, that you know, it's, it's almost um, she has such a comprehensive knowledge of how ordinary people live, how the systems work that underlie our democracy, how to work in other countries, how to um, accomplish things with people who have very, very, very fundamental disagreements with you, how to make sure that the perfect is not the enemy of the good, so that we can actually see things happen, even if they happen incrementally, more slowly than we want to see, but to make sure that things always are moving forward. I think um, the healthcare fight is really a perfect, perfect example. She was, um, you know, she, she's such a, She's such a good student, and by that I mean she looks at every, every aspect of, of every issue. She listens to very diverse points of view, and she tries to make what she thinks is the best solution move forward. But when that does not work, if that does not work, she's also willing to, and this is so critical for a commander-in-chief, for the leader of a country, and for someone who is the, um, the, the tone setter for what our American discourse is going to be like. She moves around the obstacles, she finds another way, she keeps moving forward. And to me that is the most critical, the most admirable thing that our president can do, is to give people hope that no matter what, we're going to keep moving forward, that we have the courage of our American convictions, that we have partners around the world, that we can work together for the, for the greatest good without, without um, sacrificing our ideals. And frankly, she'll be president for everyone in America. So she will need to understand the needs of people who are very different from, who have very different lives from what we see here in, in Westchester County, who have very different needs, who have very different goals. But yet, the president, in an ideal world, unites all of those people. Doesn't necessarily call for people to rise up. The American system is not one of rising up. The American system is one of creating community, creating interconnectedness, having people feel a stake in creating progress. And we've always succeeded when we've had presidents and, and government officials and community members who are able to work together to create that sense of an optimistic future for America. And I think Hillary Clinton is the person to lead us in the next, I'm going to say, eight years to do that. <laughs> on foreign trade deals that's going to help set us apart and set a measure for other countries for behavior. If we cannot adhere to things like CEDAW, which are for women's rights internationally, and if we can't have a, a model of education that is one of the top in this globe, then what kind of country are we trying to be? 
are we competing in the global market? Because we have a Danish intern who's here working on the Bernie Sanders campaign, and when I tell her about our education system, uh, she's aghast at the fact that we double down on the standardized tests, something that I know quite a bit about. Uh, we invest in books and testing and evaluative sy systems that um, no other country uh, that has successful education systems does. That's not putting us as a leader in the international arena. Uh, that scares me. I want, I want a successful education system. Uh, what also scares me is the human rights violations that happen uh, when we make deals like the TPP. If we don't want that happening here, why is it acceptable that we would allow it in a TPP agreement? Okay, sorry to interrupt. Would you mind explaining to people what the TPP is? Sorry. The Trans-Pacific Partnership <coughs> is the new uh, NAFTA on steroids, uh, if, if you will. Um, some of that will look like making allotment for child labor abroad. Things like uh, an acceptable amount of pollution that a company can be involved in and still do business with us. We're not setting the kinds of standards in our international agreements that set us apart and make us the leaders that we once were. That scares me. I believe in leadership that would have us look a little bit different than that. I'd like leadership that leads in the living wage here and helps support other countries find a pathway to do that also. Okay. In response to the TPP, the TPP to go further is, is it, it's an agreement amongst um, an arc of 12 countries, and we, with the United States included, um, I forget all the countries, but I believe that uh, New Zealand and Vietnam are also included in that too. Just so you know, um, Hillary Clinton also opposes the TPP too. Um, her two previous statements were in support of something happening. However, she has come out recently to say that she opposes it because she does not believe that we put in enough, safe, enough safety nets to ensure American job growth and to make sure that, Amer that American jobs don't go overseas. For foreign policy, I'm going to talk about specifically what she wants to do in order to increase our national security and to defeat ISIS. So, she advocates for strong U.S. involvement to defeat ISIS. Number one, she, she supports a no-fly zone over Syria. She supports training Syrian, local Syrian uh, rebels in order to, uh, to fight, uh, um, in, in order to fight ISIS. However, before the Council on Foreign Relations <coughs> last fall, uh, last year, she laid out a three-part plan in order to defeat ISIS and the broader extremist movement, and a lot of it happens to do here on our own soil. So in order for us to take care of things um, over there, we've got to take care of things over here first. One of them is by making sure that we stop radicalization here on in our own backyard. She wants to work specifically with, with social media, internet companies, technology companies, in, in order to create a counterterrorism movement that would analyze recruiting techniques within, with uh, uh, recruiting techniques that jihadists are currently using in order to recruit more people. Okay, uh, she 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 want she would like to defeat them. She would like to defeat ISIS around the world by dismantling the global network of terror that supplies radical jihadists with money, arms, propaganda, and fighters. Third, she wants to defeat them. She, she wants them to defeat, defeat them through uh, better intelligence sharing with, with our European neighbors um, and, our, and uh, our international um, allies. Uh, she's looking to, but she realizes that in order to do this, it would require skillful diplomacy. And it's also something to continue Senator Kerry's efforts to encourage political reconciliation 
in Iraq and tr to transform the political transition in Syria. She wants to be able to enable more Sunni Arabs and Kurdish fighters to take on ISIS on both sides of the border and to get our Arab and Turkish partners to actually step up and do their part in fighting this threat. Of course, it's going to require more U.S. and allied air power and a broader target set for strikes by airplanes and drones. It would require special ops units to advise and train local forces and conduct key counter-terrorism missions. But on the home front, again, we have to, she wants to make sure that they do not radicalize our own people. She wants to make sure that local law enforcement has the support that they need in order to fight, in order to track these, these, uh, these extremists and people who want to do the same thing that happened in San Bernardino down. Um, you know, also another thing that she would like to do, she wants us to, she would like America to take a closer look at the visa applicants. She would like, she would like specialists to basically take a look and monitor social media accounts of these, these visa applicants and make sure that we are not letting in the wrong people that are going to hurt us. And by wrong people, I mean the ones that are actually posting on social media that they that they want to do us harm. We need to be more. We need to step up our um, our, uh, our our uh, anal analyzation of those. Um, and as for you know, and we've talked about Hillary's um, vote on the war, or at least I, and I would like to address that if there's time. Uh, unfortunately. Okay, there's a, okay. Um, okay. So, sure. Well, I guess the most important thing that I can <coughs> say about Bernie Sanders' foreign policy is that a lifetime of mistakes in American foreign policy has taught Senator Sanders that force is the last resort. Um, and he knows that, we all do, because those of us old enough to have been around during the Vietnam War, I was just a small child, but I, I remember that well. Um, and of course, Senator Sanders voted against the first Gulf War. He, he's not a you know, total dub. I mean, he supported force in the Balkans when there was a genocide. When there is a legitimate reason for intervention, Senator Sanders is not afraid to intervene. But he does not believe that the United States, as I understand his policy, has the right, nor should it presume to know that it can walk into a country, destabilize it, walk out, and assume that everything is going to be fine. He recognized several years ago during the d debate about the invasion of Iraq that it was the wrong thing to do, it was the wrong thing for the United States, and it was the wrong thing for the world, and he of course turned out to be 100% correct. Um, and one of the interesting, I think, things that has happened to Senator Sanders as a result of the fact that the United States uh, sent so many ground troops into Iraq and then they returned home wounded with injuries that we had never really had training in dealing with, the vast amount of traumatic brain injuries that our soldiers came home with. Um, serving on the Veterans Affairs Committee, he learned firsthand about what we do to veterans, what we expect of them, and then how we drop them. And I think that has helped inform his worldview about our foreign policy. We are a country of 300 million some odd people. The vast majority of the people in our military and the rank and file are poor people. They go into the armed services for opportunity, and there certainly is opportunity, but in times of war, these people come home bruised and battered, and we have not invested in, uh, in giving them the opportunity that they deserve. As a result of that, Senator Sanders is quite circumspect when deciding to send troops into, uh, in, into danger. Um, as far as terrorism is concerned, of course, he, uh, as, as Lisa pointed out about Senator Clinton, he is um, obviously he obviously recognizes the necessity to fight terrorism both at home and abroad. I think one of the singular most important things that Senator Sanders has done is he has very vocally reached out to the Muslim community of the United States and of the world. And he's done that because that's the right thing to do. That's the American thing to do. And he's also done it to try and cut off the advertisement that 
uh, terrorist groups like Al Qaeda and ISIS have, uh, so originally in people like Donald Trump and others who fan the flames of hatred by expressing hatred and intolerance themselves. And of course, he has, uh, Senator Sanders, has made a commitment to rooting out terrorist funding networks, to um, offering logistical support in the regions where terrorists flourish internationally, to disrupting online radicalization, to offering humanitarian relief. That's a very important thing for a country like the United States to do. Um, we need to do that. We have caused some of the problems that necessitate humanitarian relief. And by reaching out to people worldwide, we show the true America, the generous America, the sympathetic America, the America of opportunity. And it's, you know, quite honestly, it's good PR too. So he also, by the way, stands for mil military preparedness that is not dictated by what was once called the military industrial complex. That's one of, the, one of his core messages, is that our military cannot be defined by big business. Companies that have lobbyists in Washington should not be telling our military experts what kind of weaponry to buy. That's really for the military people, and it should be done free of the lobbying and, and economic pressure that unfortunately seems to be fundamental to the defense department. So with all of those things, I guess I'm, I'm running out of time, I, I would say that those are important fo foreign policy initiatives and things that are very important to me as a voter to hear a uh, candidate who I hope will be the next president of the United States tell us. situation to deal with, not only at home, we all are familiar with and lived through that, but also our standing in the world had really deteriorated under the eight years of President Bush. Um, and he could have chosen anyone to be Secretary of State. And there was a reason he chose Secretary Clinton to be Secretary of State, and that was because he knew that her um, pragmatism, her standing in the world, and her, um, her devotion to um, changing the way America was viewed in the world after the disastrous Bush years, but also her devotion and her lifelong devotion to the American ideals that we're all talking about, and that she would be an excellent ambassador, our main ambassador to the world. And that is why she became our Secretary of State, because in her time as First Lady, in her time working with many various organizations, she was well known in the world. She was one of, the, she, as I said, she always ranks high as one of the most admired women, most admired women living in, in she ranks high, even when you include um, people like Eleanor Roosevelt, she ranks still up very, very high in people's um, estimation around the world because her ideals and her hard work are very, very, very well documented. People's lives all around the world, from her you know, iconic statement in Beijing to all the work she did to secure peace, to work with our allies, and to work with our enemies, um, in her time, both as First Lady uh, in a more ceremonial role, but then as, as, our, as our Senator and then as Secretary of State. So I think, um, you, you know, the, the goals that both these candidates share are the same, which is to create safety at home by creating opportunity, by not having people who are um, disaffected, disenfranchised, and become radicalized. She doesn't, she doesn't deal in, in um, in that level of um, hatred and dissatisfaction, what she is working on is the pragmatic solutions to make things better. So, so I think her goals and her, her focus on safety at home is an important component part. But I think the, the more significant reason why she'd be an excellent leader of our nation is because her work in the world is so well known. And I think that um, when you look at her experience and when you look at her, her, her goals to restore America, to continue the work that, that has happened under the Obama administration to restore America's standing in the world and to be a leader, a thought leader, uh, a leader in commerce too, because you know, I think that our um, unstable world economy contributes to a great deal of the unrest that we see in the world. Her outreach for um, 
women and children in the developing in the developing nation there's no greater investment that we can make in peace and prosperity than to educate a girl that is very 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 well documented when more women are educated when more women have economic freedom in the countries where there is the most strife you see great progress for everyone in that nation and a greater um, peace and stability in the world this is a fight that that secretary clinton has been fighting her whole entire life as a private citizen as a public figure as an elected or appointed official so i think that um, you know, we, we talk a lot about the specifics about what each candidate is going to do, but the most important thing, again, that a president of America can do is to make sure that our goals and our ideals um, are projected correctly into the world, reflective of our actions as a nation, but also that that opportunity that we cherish so much as Americans is given to other people in, in the world, and that creates peace and stability and greater, um, greater prosperity for everyone. Now I'd like to uh, have a quick five minute break so that there are uh, speakers who have been going on for some time uh, can have a little break for their vocal cords and uh, uh, so and also I'd like to consult uh, any questions that you might have submitted in so that audience members might submit questions if they have a chance to do so already. Uh, all right, uh, so we're back. Uh, this will be the, uh, the final discussion on the uh, prepared remarks, or uh, the, the, uh, the scheduled program, I guess, in the sense that uh, yeah, you know what the topic's going to be about. So this is the uh, domestic policy round. Actually, I think it went out of order. I think originally I uh, said it was going to be before foreign policy. But, so there we are. Uh, Pat, would you like to start? Uh, domestic policy. Uh, I think something that's close to all of our homes is the senator's position against uh, Indian or about closing Indian Point. It's near and dear to my heart, and I'm sure that we're all concerned about the future of uh, energy in Westchester County. And I hope that our future in energy won't be with Indian Point. I see a lot of solar panels here in Groton, and I like that. My uh, uncle and grandparents have solar panels on their house in Rockland County. And I'd like to be moving forward on uh, climate issues. It's a crisis, and it's one of the biggest things affecting us here at home. Uh, I was living in Chelsea during Sandy, and it was scary. We were without power, and I know many of you all were also without power. Another thing about the Danish intern when she came here, she was like, why are all your power lines above ground? She couldn't understand this. Um, it's really embarrassing to explain to a 20-year-old intern who's coming to visit your country to support your candidate uh, about your failing infrastructure and why you have an investment in it. Um, these are things that the senator believes in. Not only that, but uh, we're lucky to have won on Fight for 15 here in New York State, and uh, there are other states that have also won on it, but it is not yet a plan for all 50 states for us to have a living wage and the right to unionize. Uh, that's really scary. Uh, it's a principle that this country was founded on. Uh, <laughs> not founded on. It's a principle on which uh, we were built uh, up through the 50s on and where we've seen a steady decline and I think that because of the attack on unions we've also seen um, a decrease in voting. Uh, that, that kind of organization, that collectivity of community that we've seen also with the Bernie movement is something that mimics kind of that movement uh, we saw early on in uh, the labor movement and that's how people organize it's the kind of thing that I'd like to see more of and I'm proud to be a part of. I'm half distracted because people are asking me about knocking on doors. It's been something that I've been really involved in and I'm sorry that I uh, sidestepped a little bit. I'm, I'm going out to uh, call quits on that, I'm sorry. Um, Shannon, can you pick it up for me? Oh, well, you're almost done. I'm almost out of the You're allowed to Great, thank, thank you. <laughs> Uh, the fight for 15 and uh, and the 
uh, raised to fifteen dollars um, of uh, New York State's minimum wage. Hillary has long been a, an advocate of raising the federal minimum wage to twelve dollars. When she was in the Senate, she pushed for. Uh, she actually had two bills. I believe in two thousand. I don't have um, in front of my notes, but she uh, she had a bill. I believe in two thousand and three and two thousand and seven that would increase the minimum wage. The first one would increase it to seven and change, and then the second one would cre increase it to nine and change also. Um, she is a proponent of raising the federal minimum wage to $12 because she does understand that um, not every place in the country is uh, like New York or California or, or Seattle that can sustain uh, $15. So at that, from that point of view, she is very uh, tapped into um, the small business owner's um, needs and concerns. Um, one of the things that keeps that keeps on coming up to is uh, how is she going to tackle Wall Street? So I want to put forward, I want to talk to you about how Hillary has put forward a top-down, comprehensive um, uh, plan to uh, tackle Wall Street and reform it. So one of the things that she wants to do, we've all heard about um, about how her opponent wants to. Uh, uh, pass legislation that's similar to Glass-Steagall. Just so you know, that Glass-Steagall was a Depression-era uh, uh, bill um, created in 1933 that would separate commercial banks from uh, consumer banks. Now, what happened is, at, starting in the 1970s, around the Jimmy Carter time, legislation started chipping away at Glass-Steagall until it was basically nothing. So by the time it was finally repealed in 1999, there there was nothing left. So that so now what she wants to do is not reintroduce legislation that's similar to Glass Eagle. Rather, what she what she wants to do is she wants to and fully enforce uh, Dodd Frank's protections. And if you don't know about Dodd Frank, Dodd Frank is the is the bill that was passed in I believe 2010 that would um, curb in excesses from. Wall Street. She wants to make sure that things like the Volcker Rule, something that would limit banks' um, um, uh, banks' abilities to do risky investments. She wants to make sure that 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 the loopholes uh, with, with hedge funds is closed. Um, what she wants to do, she's her her Wall Street reform. It, she tackles head on the mega banks. She tackles the large investment firms. She ta she wants to tackle the hedge funds. She, this is a progressive, progressive plan that is not going to make her a friend of Wall Street at all. Uh, she wants to look at the shadow <coughs> banking system, which, by the way, has received very little oversight. We all, we all heard about that. She wants, to, she wants to hold bad actors accountable. She wants to create compensation rules that curb bad behavior, that puts the financial system at risk. She wants to make sure that the individuals behind the corporations, the corporations who are only paying fines for their bad actions, they she wants to make the, sure that the bad people who are who are behind the corporations that they are held accountable for what they've done. She, what she she would like to. Um, she wants to institute something that's called a risk fee on large financial financial institutions. That's a huge thing. What that would do is that would charge a graduated risk fee every year on the liabilities of banks that have more than fifty billion dollars in assets and other financial institutions. It means that the bigger and riskier the banks get and the riskier um, their activities get, the fee rate that they would face gets higher also. And what that's going to do is that's going to discourage these large financial institutions from relying on excess leverage and the kind of hot short-term money that they've been using that's been that led up to the 2007-2008 Great Recession. Um, one of the other things that she's looking at too, I mean, uh, is women's and reproductive rights. She has been a strong, strong champion for this. And I'll make this really, really quick, but during her time in the Senate, she has introduced she introduced eight pieces of legislation furthering reproductive, reproductive rights for women. And that is eight pieces of legislation more than any presidential candidate in this, in this race. She also made a multi-year <coughs> effort uh, making, making sure that the law was passed that would allow emergency contraception that was to be available over the counter. Plan B, the reason why people can, women can go into pharmacies and order Plan B is because of her. Um, 
She, let's see, she's, she, okay. Well, okay. well the, the issue of domestic policy is vast and, and can't obviously be covered adequately in, um, in the time that we have here. So I thought that I would spend my time with you talking about really the core of what Bernie Sanders stands for, which is restoring <laughs> equality of opportunity. And not only restoring equality of opportunity, but ensuring equality of opportunity. And his plan is to do that, of course, as I have been mentioning repeatedly while we've been, while I've had the opportunity to speak to you, first in, in tapping into each individual and making sure that they understand that they have reason to invest in this country because this country is going to invest in them. And by tapping into the unique power of each individual and the collective power of communities, we can really get a lot of things accomplished in this country. And as, of course, everyone, um, everyone knows, the cornerstone of what Bernie talks about is the growing disparity um, of income and wealth inequality. And just some quick statistics, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. The top one-tenth of one percent, one-tenth of one percent, owns almost as much as the bottom 90% of our country. That the six largest banks have assets that are the equivalent of 60% of the gross domestic product of our country. That since 2009, 58% of all new income goes to the top 1% of the people in this country. This is not sustainable. And so, that's what Bernie is really talking about. He is talking about stemming the exponential growth of the rich getting richer and creating opportunity through um, access to basic things that each and every person in this country deserves to have. How does he plan to do that? Well, the first thing is you have to tackle the financial system. And by, in order to do that, he has set forth a series of proposals there are numerous, and I would urge each and every one of you to look at his website because they're, they're, they're expressed in much greater detail than, than I can share with you now. But first, in, in general terms, the first set of rules and laws goes into bringing the financial services industry to heel by breaking up the banks through new legislation, through strict enforcement of that new legislation, uh, through an aggressive attorney general and regulatory agencies by ending that pipeline, that nasty pipeline that exists between bankers who retire and get golden parachutes who then go into government, um, and by reversing trade policies that have not favored the middle class workers in this country. Um, he then, secondly, looks to the rich people to say it's time for you people to pay your fair share. And that he plans to um, pass a progressive inheritance tax so that very, very wealthy people pay their fair share. Um, and also ending these dynasties, these dynasty trusts that exist so that generation upon generation of people can inherit millions and millions of dollars tax-free depriving other people of access to wealth because it takes money to make money. And he is trying to level the playing field. In addition, of course, then he turns his attention to what he can do for individuals. He can, and Cap is speaking about raising the federal minimum wage. In addition, he plans to cap credit card interest at 15%. I don't know if any of you know this, but credit card interest rates in this country today, some are, are bordering around 30 a nasty, nasty vortex of debt forever that, that people uh, in the dying middle class <coughs> get themselves into. And then, of course, there's going to be a massive infrastructure investment, jobs for disadvantaged youth to create hope for them, pay equity for women, which is critical, um, pay family and medical leave. We're the only industrialized country on the planet that does not offer that for its people as a matter of right. Um, lifting the cap on Social Security so that wealthy people pay into that system, they get out of that system, and they should pay into it as much, uh, as much of a portion of their income as the rest of us do. And of course, his health care for all, which I, I wish I had time to go into because it is one of 
one of the things that I think is critical in this country to restoring a sense of hope and peace of mind, to improving the quality of life, and also to creating more disposable income for people who don't have to worry about high insurance premiums, co-pays, deductibles, co-insurance, and other medical services that are not covered. Let me just give me two seconds. And, and then I also, unfortunately, want to speak to you about Bernie's plan for free tuition for all, for what is called higher public education. And his point, just to make it very briefly, is it's no longer higher education. It's really mandatory education, because in the global economy, this is what's necessary in order to make individuals competitive and to give them an opportunity to join the middle class. Secretary Clinton's um, positions are, are sort of threefold. One is that she's worked in both the public and private sector and understands how both of those systems operate so that change, in, that the reforming change that needs to happen can be made. She understands how to create that change. Um, the second is that her tireless focus, I think, on the underserved really gives her a sense of um, the, the needs of the, of the populations in our country that really have the most significant amount of need. And finally, her, her really tireless work ethic, I think, is where, where um, the opportunities for domestic policy will really, you really see things blossoming in, um, in the United States when Mrs. Clinton is president. I'm going to touch on three um, critical things, though. One is um, our energy policies. I think that um, we've heard the Secretary talk a lot about the need to revitalize the American economy while creating energy independence, which really helps to, uh, to solve a, a great deal of our problems with respect to violence around the world because of our complicated relationships with oil producing countries. If we are able to achieve energy independence by uh, really investing in our infrastructure for sustainable energy, that will not only provide tremendous opportunities for people to get back to work, including you know, this, this sort of um, uh, underemployed uh, group of young individuals who really need economic opportunity in our nation, who really need to get on that ladder to a prosperous middle class. Um, and two, of course, that it creates not only economic prosperity, but much more security at home when we are not dependent on foreign nations for our country's sort of growing energy needs. That also allows us to look at some of our um, more dangerous types of ways that we generate energy now and have less reduction, uh, less reliance on that as we reduce the needs for things like nuclear power. The second is her economic policies in general. Um, I think that this really, we haven't seen anyone who has fought so tirelessly for middle class policies that really help working families. Things like uh, paid family medical leave, things like making sure that um, women are paid the same as men at every level of their career, that women are not penalized for being for uh, raising families, for being primary caretakers at some points in their careers, making sure that there's economic opportunity for everyone regardless of their, their, um, their race, their gender, is, is just been a forefront of her policy throughout her career from her very earliest work. And then finally, I want to talk about education. I think that um, you know, we're all in agreement that that um, we do need a higher level of educational excellence in our country. We do need more people to have access to higher education. But we also need a lot of investment in our K through 12, and frankly, pre-K, birth to pre-K investment. And I think that it's a, it's a lovely idea to say um, college tuition should be free, but if we don't have students who are ready for college because they're we're not, um, addressing the achievement gap that happens at our very earliest years, then that is not as practical a solution as it is to look where the money invested can, can yield the biggest results. And that is something that, again, Secretary Clinton has been working on since her days in a law firm in Arkansas. 
the understanding of the need to invest in our children at the earliest ages so that we can see achievement, that we can see economic prosperity, and that we can once again um, have a situation where all boats rise and there's an opportunity for people, regardless of where they start out in life, to achieve and to do better in life than, than, um, than, their, parents, than their parents did. I think that uh, a lot of this campaign, both on the Democratic side and uh, in, a, in a more virulent way on the Republican side, is about people's fear that that's not happening in America anymore. And I think we need a hard worker, a pragmatic person, a person who knows how to get things done in order to achieve that level of optimism that we need uh, going forward to make sure that our, our nation's greatest days are ahead of us. So the uh, format for the the uh, audience questions. Uh, first, uh, there are a few questions that uh, there's a lot of overlap, so I'll have to summarize some of them. Um, there were also some uh, pointed questions directed at, at uh, different candidates in the interest of balance. I'll have uh, one pointed can uh, one pointed question for each, so that each side gets an equal number. And um, the last piece is uh, for each representative. Uh, only running representative from each side will be able to speak on an issue, and uh, so you you each get to have your own micro primary, I guess. <laughs> um, for each one, I mean, you can switch on and off however you want to do it. Um, and try. Uh, let's. Uh, it's going to be, I think, a little harder to have strict time limits for these, uh, but let's try to keep it to three minute responses to each question. Uh, so to begin. Uh, here is the uh, first question. Uh, it is widely accepted that Americans have lost confidence in government and elected officials. There are several aspects with the, that contribute to the problem. One uh, is uh, elected officials uh, and appointed officials uh, using their experience or uh, notoriety or connections uh, for personal gain. What would you do to limit the revolving door and uh, take uh, money out of politics and speaking fees and uh, Keep money out of politics. Sorry, I'm trying to read some of the handwriting, but that's my best approximation of this question. Um, so, who would like to answer first? From either side? Just one. Okay. Okay. Sure. All right. Okay. So, um, I think there's some valid point, points in this question. Obviously, um, I do think that Americans have lost, lost faith in their government, and I think that that. Um, it is um, a little bit um, orchestrated, as a matter of fact, by people who don't want people to think that their voice matters. And I think you see that happening, um, I would say, probably from the 1970s on, as, as a basically a Republican slash media tactic. <coughs> However, I do think that there should be some real reform in how people move from the private sector into the public sector. I mean, ideally, um, public servants uh, it should be that people can have both a public service career and a career in the private sector at different times. You know, not necessarily um, you know one that, that feeds that feeds off the other, but that people can work in the public sector for a short time and then you know continue on their career in the in the private sector, or frankly, vice versa. I mean, we want a lot of people engaged in public and appointed office in order to create the most vibrant democracy that we can have. Um, I do think that there should be ethics reforms in place so that um, people leaving the public sector can't benefit from their time in service directly by influencing things that they worked on when they were in the public sector. But I also think that, you know, as people go on in their, in their careers, obviously they're going to gain experience in various things and that's uh, it's just sort of a normal way their career trajectories happen. So I think the most important thing with respect to the trust is, is twofold. Number one is to not believe that your voice doesn't doesn't matter, and to to engage in um, in the public sphere in every in every way that you can, including you know local forums like this one. But I also think that there needs to be some pretty strict guidelines about um, how the transition from public to private sort of sector do happen. I mean, there are some good guidelines in place, and I think there probably should be um, more um, comprehensive and understandable. Um, guidelines so that people who are transitioning out of public office have some um, ethical guidelines to follow as they transition into the public sector. Into the public sector. Okay. And uh, from the side of the Me. Okay. 
So this is a wonderful question because I think what it's really what it's really asking is what has happened to the statesmanship in American politics, and unfortunately, it's gone, and it's gone in large measure due to uh, cases like Citizens United, um, and the ultra cozy relationship that very wealthy and influential individuals and corporations have with people who make decisions that affect our lives, the lives of our children, and the, the future of our country and the world. And so Senator Sanders, that's one of the critical things, um, in my judgment, that makes him uniquely qualified to run for president is that statesmanlike quality. He isn't bought by anyone. He doesn't owe anyone except all of us. That is his central message. And so when you when you engage in campaign finance, excuse me, when you, in, um, in fundraising, like Senator Sanders has done, to receive tens of millions of dollars monthly from average people, well, that's your answer right there. All right, the uh, next question is, uh, what is your position on the combination of a uh, fracked gas pipeline being installed so close to a nuclear power plant. If you were against it, what would you do uh, to stop it? And I'll also throw in, throw in there, uh, because this is was another question, uh, what is your position on hydrofracking in general? Who would like to answer from the big one side? Are we flipping? Are we going to flip? All right. Our heads are short. No fracking. Okay. But I know that she knows the dangers inherent to hydrofracking. And certainly, um, I uh, believe that all of us who have been educated on, on uh, the devastation of hydrofracking around our nation um, agree that there needs to be, um, first of all, an end to the practice and also some, um, certainly some um, remediation done for areas that have been decimated by hydrofracking. What was the first part of the question? Oh, uh, what is your position on the combination of a fracked gas mm -hmm. pipeline and being installed so close to any point? Yeah, well, if I can answer for myself. No, All right, sure. I think, um, you know, I think those of us who live in this area know that there's a, a great deal of economic injustice associated with creating so much danger around um, one specific geographic area. We, I think we are very... Um, uh, there's very widespread um, fear and mistrust about having pipeline go so close to the nuclear power plant. But to answer at a macro level, I think this really ties back into Secretary Clinton's desire to see that um, you know we move away from old forms of energy generation and that we invest in new forms of energy generation. In New York State, we actually have a tremendous opportunity because we have tremendous opportunity for hydro power. We have Niagara Falls, we have tidal waters here, um, but that requires investment and that requires working together with people to create opportunities to harness new types of energy, to create um, the, uh, the most advanced um, renewable energy uh, economy, and this is something that the Secretary has been fighting for for, for, for many years, and it's also a central point of what she talks about on the campaign trail, not only because of the energy independence issue, but because it's a way to kickstart Amer the American economy, provide opportunities, and then also, um, you know, increase safety at home by reducing our dependencies. You know, I would just like to add also that her, that her plan for, um, um, for, for energy is to make renewable energy account for 33% of energy that we have that we use in the United States by 2027. So she does have a specific energy policy for that. Uh, how will refugees from the Middle East be addressed? Hillary, 
Syrian lives is for people who have been displaced in Syria to be turned away from uh, from from the United States. Also, that they they've lost their homes in Syria. They don't. They should not be turned away here. Also, but however, she firmly believes that there has to be a vigorous process. Um, and the vigorous vetting process is going to take a while too, because she does want to make sure that that um, that um, you know exactly who is coming in. Um, so for so that's her specific policy for that. Um, I don't know if you know it, it, it's she re she recognizes the complete human rights um, imperative that we take in. Uh, that we take in people who need to come here because we because we are all immigrants and we, this is how we build our country. Um, as for uh, other specific policy, that's that's the the one that really uh, stands out um, pertaining to the Syrian refugees. Okay. All right, and uh, we have anyone who wants to come or respond on the side. Well, the Republicans have done a, quite a job in poisoning the well with their hateful and intolerant attitude toward this horrible Syrian refugee crisis. And, and I think that both, um, actually, said, uh, Secretary Clinton and Bernie, I, I think, I don't need to speak for her, but I think they're very close on this issue. Um, they're taking the right stance. Uh, I think one of the things that the Republicans have also done is that they have distracted from what is refugee policy in our country, it's not easy to get into the United States. It is true that there are other countries in the world that have a much more lax policy of accepting refugees. And, and quite honestly, I personally understand the basis for that. But that's not American policy. It takes, I believe, 18 months at a minimum after strict scrutiny um, for people to be able to come into the United States and receive <coughs> that kind of um, asylum. And, and, of course, uh, Senator Sanders has been very vocal in uh, welcoming an appropriate number of refugees into the United States who have been displaced as a result of the violence that has taken place in countries like Syria. Um, it's a necessary thing to do. It's the right thing to do. And um, it's an important thing to do in combating terrorism. We all recall when Donald Trump made that ridiculous statement um, that he was so proud of, and that tapped into so much of the fear and hatred um, that we've unfortunately seen unleashed as a result of people like him and how they speak. Um, but the truth is, is that positions like that are the very best market <coughs> tool for ISIS and Al-Qaeda. And so um, <coughs> Senator Sanders has a responsible policy about accepting Syrian refugees into the United States. And uh, this is a question that was uh, originally directed to uh, one candidate, but I'm editing it slightly uh, so that it can be addressed to both. As the parent of a college freshman, I'm intrigued by the prospect of uh, free tuition for all and or debt-free college education. But what will that mean for our tax base? And uh, will I answer this? <clears throat> Did we start? I don't know. Uh, sure. Okay. So uh, Wall Street speculation tax is largely how you pay for tuition-free college. Uh, Wall Street has largely uh, socialized risk and privatized profit. We'd like to put that a little bit more, tip the scales a little bit more in our favor and uh, put a tax on that speculation. If you're going to uh, gamble with everybody's future and we're going to have to bail you out, well maybe you should pay for everybody to go to college. And we heard just a little bit earlier about K through 12 education. And again, I want to harp and uh, or, or liken that to the Danish intern again, because on their pathway, they start that uh, in high school. Their their pathway to college starts in high school, and that's something that we should be working on here, uh, shaping our kids uh, for a path uh, to college while they're still in high school, uh, making a more decisive track instead of learning about some of these archaic uh, English and uh, mathematical things that they'll never use in practical day-to-day -day life. Okay, and, uh, sure. Um, I think that um, Secretary Clinton's plan for college tuition relief is actually
actually um, the more um, um, suitable for the uh, situation that we have here in, um, in America, which is that um, college tuition should not be an onerous burden. I think we all are in agreement with that. We want to give as many students in our nation the ability to achieve the highest level of education so that we can grow and prosper and thrive as a nation. Um, it sort of ties into uh, a question uh, about refugees and, and other immigration policies, which is that one of the things that attracts people to America frequently at the college level is our higher education system. So we want to make sure that that is accessible to as many American students as possible. And I think that the, the way to do that is to have a graduated system of relief. First of all, to tackle the high cost of student debt. It is ridiculous that I have a, I have a junior in college and a child who's going into college in the fall, and it's ridiculous that our students come out of four years of education with this onerous debt. They're not, you know, it's not from medical school, it's from just a regular four-year education where they've gotten a bachelor's degree. So that's an area that needs a tremendous amount of reform and that the Secretary is putting a laser focus on really making sure that that area is reformed so that we're not burdened by debt and our young people have a chance to start their, um, start their economic lives without that onerous burden. But the other thing too is that college, I feel as a parent that um, college should, you should have some skin in the game in your college education. It's one of the reasons why um, I insist that my children, for example, have jobs to pay for some of their expenses because when you work and earn something, you take it more seriously and you achieve greater success with it. And, and the Secretary's plan is, is sort of based on that idea, which is that there are some families who can pay full tuition. We know that. And we also know that um, there are families for whom college education is a terrible burden. So there should be a sliding scale that, so that families who can't afford um, any tuition do get free education, but then uh, families who can afford some incremental piece of it should also pay into that system. The real problem, uh, as I see it, is that col the, college, the cost of college has gone up so much, and, and the incidental costs have gone up so much, and that's where the reform really needs to happen, to look at why is college such a big, booming, profit-making business. But I do want to throw back to my other education comment, which is there's so much evidence. I mean, it's not new evidence either. It's like 30 years old and just keeps um, getting more and more reinforced that the best education dollars are spent from babyhood to entering, um, entering pre-K. If you, uh, the gap between a child who has had um, 10,000, who has, uh, you know, 10,000 words spoken to them by the time they get into um, pre-K versus a child who's had 3,000 words spoken to them is an unbridgeable gap. So you need to have, you need to put that focus where the dollars are best spent in our earliest childhood education and make sure that our K through 12 system is preparing our students to succeed in college. Can you just make a brief comment? Are we doing rebuttals? Oh, no, it's not a rebuttal. <laughs> no, it's not a rebuttal, it's just an observation. But I won't do um, can I have well, can I talk about co the cost of college though? It was a little bit um Senator Christian's um plan is winning loss because that was part of the that was part of um, the question. We're yeah. over time okay. and that, but I let him run because I support universal preview. <laughs> 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 <Same. laughs> <laughs> 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 yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> um and uh, given the late hour, I'm actually gonna ditch uh, to the appointed questions. Sorry guys, uh, I'm gonna do the uh, last one which I think is very appropriate. Uh, for both candidates, for the last 25 to 30 years, Republicans have uh, at best been uncooperative and at worst been downright obstructive to Democratic presidents. What makes you think your candidates can get anything accomplished? Uh, so I want to take it first. Good question. Do you, I, 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 yeah, I sure. First. Go ahead. Okay. So I think that the Secretary will be able to do it because um, she did it. I think that we saw from the time when she transitioned from being the first lady, where you know she was really the subject of a lot of criticism and a lot of um, very, in, in my opinion at least, um, unfair um, personal attacks, to the time that she became a senator. She showed her ability to work with people um, who she had 
very, very, very little in common with people who hated her, frankly, at a personal and visceral level. But when she saw the opportunity to get things done, she was able to work with them. It's something that she has done her whole career. But one of the things I personally admire about her a great deal is that you can't knock this woman down because she is always, always, always back, ready for the fight, back, ready, and, and not in a, not in a, um, in a pugilistic way or in a, in a um, you know, sort of le lecturing, moralizing way. It's more in a way that, okay, this, this didn't work. Let me turn around and see if this thing works. Let me turn around and see if this slight difference works. Let me turn around and reach out to this person. Um, let me, let me try reaching out to this group. And I think that she's had so much success doing that. I think that is the key to any Democrat, any Democratic leader in, in any situation, because I think that the Republicans have taken a very hard turn away from government. They do not believe in our American society and the fabric of our American society. They really want to tear it down, which makes it all the more critical for us to work um, together collaboratively and to work together um, in a very um, hands-on way to make sure that we are able to rebuild the American fabric that the Republicans absolutely want to tear from the hands of ordinary Americans. Okay. And uh, we want to answer for Sandra. I can take this one. Okay. Well, I think that is the, the brilliance of what Bernie Sanders is all about. He understands what democracy really means. Democracy is us. And by giving, telling us, not only can you have power, but you should use your power. Speak, express yourself, take a position, join together, get active, be engaged. That's how we're supposed to get things done in a democracy. And what has happened and what has enabled the Republicans to hijack progress is because we're not engaged. And they don't, they don't pay attention to us. Bernie Sanders says we have a voice, let's use it. And through political pressure, by speaking out, by becoming engaged, that's how we get things done in this country. So when Bernie Sanders is president, we will be speaking about these things. We will be organizing for change. And then those landlords Republicans, they're going to have to come along, because if they don't, they won't be in office anymore. In fairness, I'll let Pat make an additional comment if she'd like. OK. Sorry, but go ahead. Um, well, I, I, would just, I would just like to say that, um, that, that Senator Clinton in um, uh, as a staunch Democrat, she, uh, she has raised over $100 million, I believe, and of that $100 million, $18 million has gone towards uh, de other Democratic candidates and Democratic parties. So what she wants to do is she wants to make sure that there are Democratic candidates and people in office up and down the pipeline in order to deal with the Republican Congress and other Republican leaders in order to get the, uh, the Democratic progressive agenda across. So we want to make so that's what her contribution is for it. So we need to keep that in mind as we go about as Democrats saying, listen, she is fighting for us and she's fighting for our party. Head to head, uh, Bernie Sanders does better than any other candidate against the Republicans. Uh, he's winning by double digits in Mars's polls and uh, many other polls. Uh, Rand Paul, his words, I'd rather work with Bernie than HRC. And also, 20% of uh, the Republicans in Vermont vote for Bernie. Uh, he, he wins by 70, 80% during his elections, uh, that he's been reelected 14 times, too. I think that his history working across the aisle has gained him respect, and most of the Republicans that work with him say as much and are looking forward to <coughs> working with him than any other candidate. All right, well, uh, with our forum, uh, thank you very much to the library for hosting us, to our uh, grassroots advocates for representing <laughs>